Welcome. Thank you for joining us. On behalf, uh, my name is Charmaine Wicklow, and on behalf of Dean Dara Byrne, we'd like to welcome you to Macaulay Entrepreneur Series. And today we're going to be introducing Catherine Serrano Sosa, um, who is joining us today, along with Labiba Nazrul. And today I think we're going to have such a great talk and with these women in architecture. Um, what I'll do right now is just give you a little background and introduce Labiba, who's moderating the discussion today. So Labiba Nazrul is a senior at the Macaulay Honors College at City College, pursuing her Bachelor of Architecture degree with a minor in psychology. She has a variety of experience in multiple facets of architecture, ranging from traditional design to project management to general design and construction. Labiba is interested in how spaces of different scales are designed and how its inhabitants use them. So I would like to welcome Labiba. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. And I will actually let you take over. And I'll see you soon. Thank you for the introduction. So hi, I'm Labiba. Nice to meet everyone. And it's my pleasure to introduce Catherine Serrano Sosa who is a New York State licensed architect who is native to El Salvador. She came to the U.S. at seven, and although she has her roots in New York, she still maintains a strong connection to her Salvadorian roots. Catherine graduated from the Spitzer School of Architecture at CCNY and Macaulay in 2016 and became licensed in 2019. She's worked in various types of scales and projects across the city for the past eight years, and in 2021 decided to create Rooted Architecture Studio, which we'll learn about today. So, Catherine... Serrano Sosa. <laughs> Thank you, Lobi, but that was an amazing introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, so yes, I'm Katja Serrano Sosa. I'm looking forward to uh, this webinar and answering your questions along the way. Yes, yeah, so, so I think it'd be good start. Yeah, I think it'd be nice if we maybe go in order of from school to where you wanted to go to and then work and where you are now. So just okay. an introductory question. Did you ever imagine yourself becoming the owner of your own firm when you were an architecture student? No, uh, I did not. Uh, if you had asked me even, say, uh, 2019, pre-pandemic, uh, if I wanted to own my own firm, I would have laughed. <laughs> uh, and, in a scared anxiety, like, I thought it was too overwhelming or mm -hmm. just, like, it wasn't my path. Um, but... Uh, uh, the pandemic changed my perspective on life, what I wanted to do, uh, and uh, it did some soul searching. And then within that, I got the idea that starting my own firm would then geared me to what I wanted to do in life and uh, create a path um, towards that. Yeah, definitely agree. I feel like in architecture school, a lot of us joke around saying that I could definitely see myself being like the CEO of my own firm and stuff, but it is very hard to actually go through with it. So many kudos to you for doing it. Thank you. And how's your Thank experience you. in school with professors and studio work in general kind of applied to the work you do now? If it does. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's start off with professors. So um, my first professor, I won't name his name but uh, was slightly traumatic and scary. Um, I came from a very, uh, I was, I want to say a book nerd. Uh, I was more of the science, math, uh, more practical, didn't have, I loved art. I was creative, but not in the architecture sense creative where you think spatially and out of the box, so out of box. So um, he, pushed my boundaries more than I was comfortable with. And maybe it's just a way of teaching. Jumping to see, uh, semester two, I had an amazing teacher who pushed me out of my boundaries in a more uh, suitable way to me. Mm -hmm. And then um, from there, I was just, okay, yeah, this is definitely my, my thing. Um, uh, I don't know if she still teaches it with Professor uh, Wines. If, oh, um, yeah, she does. Yes, yes. So she uh, she is amazing, and uh, along the the through the years, I took what kids or students would call the harder teachers, 
mm-hmm. which were tended to be the females, um, just because I wanted to be pushed. Once I got a little more assertive and confident in what I did, um, and they pushed me even further. And um, with them, I was able to um, really go into topics that I cared about. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, actually, through Macaulay, we had to take science in New York City. Or, um, and we were learning about sustainability and lead and all of that. Within that, then I became obsessed with that topic in architecture. And um, I started doing a lot of green roofs, uh, incorporating plants um, and how they affect the, um, the body and our men- me- mental health. Um, and I do not apply that directly to my work right now because um, I have smaller projects or even my larger projects are, are not ground up. Mm-hmm. But I do try to uh, take the concept of how to create a space more natural, have more light, um, more of passive design, uh, biophilia, um, uh, in that sense, bringing in nature. And also, um, I uh, a lot of things, topics that I learned through through the different projects that we did um, really helped me uh, see what I liked and did not like, which helped me choose where I worked mm-hmm. uh, through my years. Yeah, no, <clears throat> definitely agree. Also with the fact that the Macaulay classes, I feel like um, as an architecture student, you get so like wrapped in like structures, construction technology and studio and all that. But Macaulay was like a nice reminder that there are also outside stuff that could influence work and all that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, all those four classes that we have to take, the Arts in New York City was amazing, mm-hmm. science. Uh, they all really... Uh, I guess informed the way I designed a different way, which mm-hmm. made us, I think it made us unique within our classes. Yeah, definitely. And I guess kind of similar to that, were there any lessons you learned from school in general that you still carry with you today? Um, yes, some learned during school and some I learned uh, reflecting back on what I did in school. Mm-hmm. So um, what I learned in school was that uh, there is no one way of uh, really doing things um, that you um, as, there are some things that are they can truly be non-subjective but like to some degrees like don't take things too hard because sometimes someone's comment is subjective and if it's like structural related or uh, the space is in flow or it's not really code compliant or are you making a two foot wide hallway uh, uh, that takes too hard because you'll learn it'll truly affect but everything else if someone doesn't like your curved wall understand why but it's okay like you did it because that's the concept you were going for it's kind of getting a little more firm of what you wanted to design and believe in but take criticism um and then i would say something reflecting back i was uh very hard on myself in school and i would always compare myself to my previous semester to keep out doing myself to a point that I could have reduced the stress on myself. So I think if I, one lesson I learned is that you don't need to always be working extremely hard because that actually may affect your creativity. Mm -hmm. So sometimes taking that break is actually good for you. (laughs) So yeah. I was worse to live by. Do you feel like now in like your work environment you still keep those in mind and you give yourself breaks here and there because you learned from your mistakes in college yeah yeah and um to be fair like my first job i had right out of college i would like go beyond and above thank god it wasn't one of those firms that forced not forced you really asked you to work really late hours but um i would always push myself like oh I can I should stay a little bit later and finish this and um and I wouldn't say too too late but like um I think over time I realized that um there's a notion with architecture and if anyone here truly believes this it's your your thought process uh I respect it but the way I see life now it's like I uh I am not defined by being like by by architecture it's not my whole life like mm-hmm. I 
Uh, so it's a part of me and it, it definitely informs of who I am as a person, but it's not everything. So yeah, so now I try to get involved in other things and have time for myself, especially as a, I, run, I, I run my own company. It can be a lot of stress. And um, I definitely been trying very hard to implement um, different uh, tactics to keep myself well in balance. And it's, it's a learning process, progress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really do respect that. I feel like that's such a huge problem in the architecture field that a lot of people are beginning to address it, just like how toxic the work environment is and stuff. And I'm glad yeah. that you had, you took the step to, you know, address it for yourself and realize you have to take a step back. Can't be everything. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I guess transitioning from school to the actual professional field, you somewhat touched mm-hmm. on it, but how was it like going from designing these hypothetical, very conceptual driven, your own individual work into designing for the real world and working with like Department of Buildings and FAR and everything like that? Um, it was, um, it wasn't that much of a shock to me mm. because of the steps I took during school, like the internships I took, um, uh, to kind of like, I'll, I'll touch base on that, but it, it was, uh, so I took, I believe the summer after second year, I actually volunteered at the building department mm-hmm. in my town. So I touched code and construction documents, understand, like seeing what they would look for, even before I had construction technology, like actually knowing how to detail a wall. So mm-hmm. uh, taking that leap, there because I couldn't find an internship that year because they said I was still too young. I didn't have enough CAD experience. Uh, they uh, uh, actually informed me knowing like, okay, this is the technical side, like what most people call the boring side. Um, um, and then going through that, I worked with an architecture engineering company for a summer where they were, t- the first project I did was a bathroom, which is the running joke. in our field uh so i think getting those little uh things ahead uh, out of the way through the schooling like my mind was still being restructured because i believe architecture school definitely restructures the way you think in your whole Mm -hmm. brain um as i was becoming more creative and uh thinking conceptually i had this like groundingness it's like oh i know it's going to be this Mm -hmm. uh and then so when i jumped into my first full-time job I had a grasp of both and it was hard at first because I wanted to design. I wanted to create something uh, beautiful. I went from doing this big thesis project that was so conceptual and um, mm-hmm. and like my dream project to uh, smaller things. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a little hard to grasp that end, but I knew it was going to be technical. So I just tried to absorb as much information as I could. And I think that helped me uh, jump further in my career um at the beginning like it accelerates certain things so I, I all i wanted was to really just absorb all the information my my bosses could provide mm-hmm. yeah and i definitely think that's like one of the plus sides of being a college student the fact that like nothing is permanent so you could try out as many things as you can while you're there yeah. to see what you like and don't yeah. like and it worked yeah. out well for you so <laughs> yeah that and then you kind of mentioned, kind of touched on this, but any moments of dis- eh, disillusionment when you saw how projects operated in real time, now that you're seeing it like in a realistic s- scale? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, uh, and it's, it, it goes two ways. One disillusionment is that in school, we are more or less our own clients. Mm-hmm. or we have a theoretical client and then we have the prof- our professor who kind of becomes this like client as person who when co-works with us with the design i think one of the solution mates and now i'm making it a positive thing in as i own my firm and do projects that clients have very strong opinions and um sometimes they come in and think that just because they watch hgtv or mm-hmm their father did construction or they did the interior design of 
of their older home, um, they can uh, co-design with us. So in a way, you just have to be kind and educate them why they need to hire you and why there's certain things that they won't know and um, just re-guide them. So that's why I kind of, uh, with my company, I call it it's like uh, problem solving, like uh, through design. That's like what I do because it's, I'm trying to become with the, an idea, an issue, but then you have to create, you need to problem solve it to make co meet code, be the aesthetic that they want. Um, and also budget. Uh, that's another thing that you have to think budget wise in real life in school. We didn't. Um, and then, uh, let's see what else. Can you say the question again? Because I, know, I think I missed the uh, uh, yeah. component. Um, any moments of disillusionment when you saw how projects operated in real time? Oh, okay. So the, the for operation in real time. Um, how sometimes, it's not a disillusionment, but just like a reality check that sometimes projects, people want it rushed. And when it's rushed, things can go wrong. Um, or when you take the time and it, you do your part correctly, then like sometimes construction just goes on a stall because money or something else. So it's just like, you, you never know. There's so many moving pieces in a realistic project that mm -hmm. um, you have to let go of wanting to go a certain way. There's, you'll always have to adjust even through construction. Something happens that you can't build it a certain way. So you have to just creative thinking on the spot or within the next day or two, how to solve that issue that has come up. Do you have any specific stories maybe of like one of these hard clients that you had to work with or like when a project took a turn for the worse and you had to quickly problem solve? Um, let's see. There's been, oh, there's been quite a few clients that have been <laughs> a little, okay, so. This was my first full-time job. I had a client. Mm -hmm. uh, she had quite a bit of money. So like she was making something very, a very high-end custom home. And um, she wanted to really have a hold on the design to the point that when we gave her uh, uh, our like uh, power and data plan, she came back with colored pens telling us to move Ooh. them over six inches here and there. Because she, uh -huh. she thought she wanted it like perfectly aligned certain feet away from the bed or the couch. But what she, we had to educate her, or at least we attempted. Well, my boss tried. I was just there listening. Educate her that you can't just locate an outlet, especially in a wood frame. You have to put it attached to a stud. So sometimes mm -hmm. you, you either have to do extra wood or um, you just do it against the stud. So like, trying that was one of the trooper ones and she did the same thing with lighting and other nuances uh um i thought that was a funny one but also harsh it's like why are you moving it six inches over the gc was also like what um but uh and then looking that's a smaller scale like that's mm -hmm. a home and i worked on i've worked on a lot of medical offices so for instance uh one project i've worked on was a um paced renovation for a medical center in babylon new york and what was meant to be a year-long project became two and a half years long because internally they they changed certain management so they changed their whole program so we had to redesign halfway through the project and make work what was already built and halfway through that as well there was abatement to be done. There was asbestos. So we had, I had to learn how to uh, coordinate that. And we need to stop work for two months just for abatement and then go on with construction. And I'm um, dealing with contractors who in that same project uh, uh, built, we had them build this, uh, concrete stairs three times because they used uh, a concrete batch that wasn't good when they did the seven day break test and then the second time they didn't use the correct aggregate so everyone was slipping and falling when it was raining uh -huh. so it's like little thing little things like that that you think is like oh it's a simple like five step concrete step but at the end of the day it had it took months to get done because materials and so forth and it wasn't 
like just the DC's fault. And one round it was the inspector that didn't catch the batch before it was poured and so forth. There's a lot of players in the game. So uh, our job is to coordinate, but we can only do so much. Yeah, I mean, I've only ever <laughs> designed and like done architecture in a bubble. So it's kind of scary to imagine when all these factors that you're mentioning coming in and impacting yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah, but, um, yeah. So I guess now that you have like, you know, all this experience and stuff post-graduation, what was the deciding factor that pushed you to create your own firm? Um, there were a few. Um, I guess one of them I like, kind of touched base is like, I wanted more of a life work life balance, mm -hmm. which I laugh at it now a little bit because when you own your own firm, you're, you're like, you're an octopus. You, you have a hands on everything, accounting, administration, this and that. But at the same time, I can coordinate um, when I do something, when deadlines are done, creating boundaries with clients and say, okay, I can start your project in three weeks because you just signed out the contract and to finish something else first. Um, that was one of them, like work-life balance. Um, I was working in the city prior to working on my, on my own. So uh, that was a little draining, was draining me a bit, the commute. Um, it, I mean, it was great at the beginning and then after I realized like there's more, uh, more things I want to do than commuting. Mm -hmm that long it was an hour and 20 minutes one way an hour and 20 back if I missed the train it was even more um and the back end of like I've had great bosses but they weren't perfect so I would always see certain things in them that I wish I could do differently or project differently um a uh, part of it was that um a lot of it was, um, uh, how do I put it? It's not the way they treated people, but it's like the type of clients they brought in they didn't fully align with my values at the end of the day. So I realized, although I'm working on really nice big projects, I would rather be working with clients that I make a difference. Um, I mean, I made a difference making medical offices. I, that I feel great, be having a hands on all of that, especially during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um but i just felt there was more to it so um when uh, uh i just wanted to like find my my why again in architecture and how i can create a change or at least um ch uh, change one person's life like if it's their home or their office space like something like that and make it more personable and uh being bilingual i also wanted to kind of uh have that involved somehow because it's it's a part of me that wasn't really involved in my career so I wanted to be able to work bilingually with people um and then there's one more which is uh the education pro uh, section of my company um I felt like I if I did it, it on my own I could I was able to do more than just design. Like I can inform people um, about what, why we do the things we do and who we are. And it started at something, um, I created my little mission, my purpose, my values for us was creating my company, uh, like like business plan. And um, it, it felt like me. So uh, I, I just ran along with it and it evolved it's been evolving over time. It was something that uh, was something small. I'm like, oh, I'll do this in two years. And then I actually, certain things I got to do earlier on just because it, it was the right moment. Yeah, I mean, kind of answered the next question too, which is <laughs> what does Rooted Architecture stand for and what is its mission? So I guess you mentioned that it evolved from like where it began to where it is now. So... How would you describe yeah. that journey? Like what caused the changes? Um, uh, I've always promoted it. So like I always, the way I, uh, my, I guess 30 second elevators pitch is that I'm a Latina owned bilingual architectural and design firm. Um, 
that uh, is trying to uh, uh, create roots and expand connections. So that was like, um, it's not just a design, it's like how can this design create connections, whether within your home, your family, or who's ever using your space. Um, and um, I started with that and I, uh, and my base educational component of that was that I just wanted to be that friendly architect who had the patience to sit down with someone and explain, okay, we're going through this schematic design, design development, construction document. It's not you just telling me what you want and I'll have the drawings done in two weeks. Like educating uh, anyone outside of our field, what mm -hmm. it takes. So it was just me like doing that through my clients. And um, it has evolved with me uh, creating monthly blogs on different topics. Uh, I have three booklets on my website now that uh, one on zoning and building codes, one on the stages of construction, and one recently I posted on paints. Um, uh, that did that one out of personal experience. I was redoing my room, selecting paints, and I realized people don't understand there's more than one type of paint. Uh, and a lot of people paint on their own. So let me give you some education so you have the power to paint your own space, whether it's the concrete wall um, that's exposed from your house or um, metal things with everything uses a different paint um and then uh recently also a few months ago i started to post more on my social media with little snippets of information uh so it's expanding into like an educative outside of just my clients so uh whomever i reach i reach and um and it's bilingual most of them so i did in english and spanish to um to be able to reach even more people through time. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's such an important thing in the architecture field, especially because there's so much jargon and technicalities that like someone who isn't in the field would have no idea what, you know, we're talking about or what we're designing. So having, you know, you mm -hmm. act as a middle person to kind of break that down, solve so many problems for later on when it comes to designing. Yeah, yeah. And and I just see it um, that not many Maybe it's generational. I think mm -hmm. millennials tend to be a little more hands-on on things. And uh, we're, we're changing the way the work environment is in general, but just the way we approach work. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, just a little like side note, not side note, but like example of this is like, I had a meeting actually last week for a new project. Um, they just need to rebuild their second story deck. Um, but they had an architect prior um, that he was busy, he, they couldn't use him. So they reached out to me through referral. Um, and I was trying to talk to them through things and they had no clue what the other architect had done. They just said, we just paid him and he said everything was okay. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at the papers. The architect went through a whole zoning variance without telling them what was going on. Um, they did, the clients had no clue what a survey was, but it was in the package they had given. They just saved the papers uh -huh. and they had never looked at them or understood them. And I understand like, it's okay if you don't want to know, but it's up to us as architects to also inform the, the client because if God forbid I were to pass away or like I am so busy and I need to give you a referral to another architect, at least you know what to look for. Because there are people out there that take advantage of people and if you don't know the basic that you need to serve, if you didn't know you had a survey, I could have easily gone to her and said, you need a new one. And then she already had one. Mm -hmm. So it's like saving money here and there. But um, so I see that as difference of like the older architects. They kind of just went in. It's like, hey, this is what I do. Tell me what you need and I'll get it done. But it's good to educate. I think it's better to inform the person. Yeah, unless they tell you I don't want to know, then, yeah. then it's on them. Yeah, but definitely a change that's necessary, making it more, I guess, personal rather than just architect client. But it's understanding where each other is coming from. Yeah, and I mean, there's always boundaries too. Yeah, like, uh, like I get clients trying to text me or call me on a Sunday. I'm like, uh, it's Sunday, <laughs> no, <Yeah. laughs> but it happens. Establishing the boundaries. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it sounds like you already have so much 
experience and you worked on projects already in your new firm and things like that. But what was it like in the very beginning when you started straight from scratch? Yeah, straight from scratch. Like, did you have any mentors, any connections, any like marketing? How was that whole new world of advertising yourself? Um, I didn't really ask. <laughs> okay, I didn't ask people in person directly. I researched sources myself. Like, I just bought books, looked mm-hmm. at information online. Um, the there were like probably two people I told about me wanting to start a firm even before I applied for a PLLC, which was my um work best friend and my he was my mentor. He was he I I worked under him up to the point we were both PMs, um, and he co-designed my logo with me. He was he's always been my biggest cheerleader. Um, and, um, and I'm always like trying to push him too, because he's not licensed. So I'm like, you need to get licensed because you can be where I'm at. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so he was a great support system and you can do it, just go for it. And also talking to my old boss about it because I slowly built up to going on my own. I started as a side job, like, um, oh, like weekends uh night job it was side hustle in 2021 2022 i actually went part-time and then um as of february of this year i've been full, fully on my own um so i didn't jump the leap and i did that because i researched and i knew the 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 numbers of uh how many failed uh ventures people have and i just wanted to be safe mm-hmm. uh, but yeah i um I read a lot of things online on how to start an LLC and I kept, I kept the, like, I have a little, I used to do a journal of like everything, like uh, journaling and like new ideas were personal. Um, So I had a little section on career and I would jot down everything about LLCs. And um, I found a book called Architect Plus Entrepreneur. Uh, It was an architect from Maine yeah oh no vermont i think vermont uh or maine uh one of the two um they started his own firm and wrote two books about it so then i read them uh it gave me um confidence of like i can do this like he goes more in depth about doing a million and one things but i took out what i ref- uh reflected on that i wanted to do and then i read uh aia small business firm book for like running a business and um it's just little things here and there. And it was all a trial and error. Like I tried to, I got my own EIN number from the IRS. And then I realized I didn't, I, there was no way I could file taxes myself or everything else. So then I got an accountant and um, they helped me. They set up my QuickBooks. Um, I did hire someone to do my PLLC filing. This, uh, New York has an elaborate path for architects or any other professional. You have to, you can't just apply for an LLC and needs to go to the Department of Education, to the Department of uh, Corporations, and then back to the education. Um, so I hired someone for that, but I kind of took the lead on other things. And um, marketing, I started before I had the LLC uh, formalized, I started um promoting myself to doing like little projects inside on like Facebook, like local Facebook groups. I'm like, Oh, I'm licensed. And I, I was, I've always been really upfront and honest on things. Uh, and I said like, I have a full-time job, but I'm licensed. I can do small projects. i uh, reach out if you want. And through that, I met, I got a couple, like, uh, I through that. I met a group for small businesses. So I joined it. I met a contractor who's a female and I got a couple of projects through her. I still have some projects with her. Um, and then I had, uh, I reached out to people I knew, like I had worked for a landscape architect. So I reached out to her and said, like, Hey, do you have any projects that you don't want to take? Or, you know, she actually got me one. Um, that was a Hispanic family. So it was my first uh, big project. Uh, was like I had to translate into Spanish, which was a learning curve in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, from once the company was like 
formalized and I went live on Instagram and everything else. That's when I tried to just market on groups every now and then. Um, but I got lucky that it, like, uh, most of my work has been word of mouth. Um, like, um, because I was doing it part time for like a year, well, a year and a half. Um, I only took so many pro projects at once. So um, I only started to post on groups when I knew a project was going to end. Now that I knew I was going to go fully on my own, I started doing Google ads and I tried Yelp for like a month, but it didn't really do much. Uh, but yeah, to this day, it's all either referrals or social media, like um, just Facebook or Instagram posts or um, other networking groups I'm part of. Like uh, I'm, I'm part of quite a, I want to say like five or six of them. Um, some I'm more involved in than others, but um, learning to network and create connections, you never know. Some people, uh, like uh, there's a lawyer I met, she's super sweet. Uh, she she's a lawyer, but like she works with contractors and clients who are in need of architects. So every now and then she reaches out, and says, like, "Hey, I think you can do this project." So um, and the same if like I meet them and like I know a friend who needs a lawyer, I can refer her. It's all about helping each other out, which I think it's a little different than school because we were in a weird way we were put against not against each other, but like whose project's better. Yeah. Unless you're in groups, then it's like which group is better. But in reality, uh, once you change your mindset, it's like everyone's just trying to elevate each other. I mean, there's still those people who are like me, me, me. I want to get to the top. Mm -hmm. But it's all the way you improve and grow is through a community, and uh, accepting that and being open to that has like really opened up my doors in many ways. Mm -hmm. Glad to hear it because, I mean, it's not a small feat, you know, to start from nothing and make your own brand yeah. and everything. And now here you are and you're still expanding yeah. your network to make the business grow. So congratulations for that. Thank you. And yeah, fun. like I, I did my own website. I did my own everything. And it was the first trial was like, eh. Like I actually in April, I launched my website again. I actually finally hired a website designer and they manage it now for me one less task for me to do but uh sometimes you have to do it yourself to learn I think yeah you can't just also blindly give something to someone because then it's not authentically you like you have to kind of play with it yourself and then say okay this is the bare bones can you just put it together to look like what I'm trying to express but nicer <laughs> and that's that's how it is <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you just gained like 10 new skills from becoming your own business. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, definitely. And I guess after, you know, everything's been established and stuff, can you name maybe one project or experience you had with a client or maybe just a project in general that made you think that all this hard work that you did was worth it or like you opening your firm was definitely the right choice to do? Um. Yeah, um, there's, I mean, this is not much on the design end itself, but just the impact I, like, I kind of felt like I made for the family. Uh, so they are, they were his wife family. They actually, um, I have two families. Well, I'll talk about both, but like both of them, but like this family, um, one of their sons is autistic. Um, so it's, you know, when, and only I have, cousins who are autistic so I know how to uh, work with them and knowing that like they're just like us humans just sometimes you can't always communicate in the certain the same way as everyone else and having the patience and um just like knowing that they had to uh, coordinate with that but also they had only a certain budget they were trying to they had uh their twin daughters who wanted to get their own rooms and um the son to keep his own room and they wanted their own space and um we did completely interior renovation in their home where the first floor became this beautiful open space for them and then they had be great bedrooms upstairs and um the the way they they were so sweet and thankful afterwards and um like as if I had done like 
magic or something and it wasn't like you know like high-end custom mm -hmm. design it was like a, a beautiful uh lower middle income home just revamped got to look like almost new and um it just changed their whole dynamic of living and just the way their kids also felt in the space so that just made me feel so good that i was not only make them feel comfortable that i could be there talking to them and have their kids around but um at the end of the day they love their their home more than than ever and then the other one i was going to mention this is similar case um uh, it was a, a, a couple who um, uh, also had an autistic daughter, actually my age. So they wanted to make a space for her to feel comfortable as her own, but also keep it creating open space. So we made this huge kitchen with a 15 foot long island. We had a little like then area for the daughter to be able to watch TV, do her, her things and feel like they can still like see her but it was still felt like homey her own space so um and um they were on the verge of retirement so like to them afterwards they're like oh i feel like i just bought my retirement home but it's just <laughs> the home i've lived in the past 20 years so yeah th those two have been like the sweetest ones glad to hear it sounds like um i feel like when you recount on experiences or like things you've done for other people it really we seem about how far you've come. I mean, I hope I hope it's like that for you too. Yeah, like, everything was working. Yeah. yeah, no, it's true. And like, like you mentioned, like I wasn't born here. I'm an immigrant, so like I grew up a little out of tangent here. But uh, I lived in the South Village of Seven. My parents were well off. Uh, my mom was an accountant, a uh, really great job. Coming here was a completely culture shock. Plus, economically, we barely had anything. Like, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have our own apartment until like probably like nine months into living here. Like, and um, re I was very aware child, and I always ask why th things. And like, it made me grow up a lot faster. But like, also knowing what like wealth is, and like what having nothing is, and like just finding that in between where you can be happy and you don't have to like surpass others just for making money it's like you can work community community wise and do it um so i try to do that like uh through my projects like if a client with not much has like I, if i can help a little i will and like try to find cheap materials or what we can do and still look nice and then like knowing uh and then like i do get high-end clients and that's where i get to have fun and not really have a budget or be more design based but um i think architecture is more than just a pretty aesthetic it's it's about society and how we interact and all of that definitely i think one of those skills that any architect should have or like hone is definitely empathy and it seems like yeah. you have that and hone that a lot in your work yeah yeah i'm a very empathetic person like uh clinically an empath <laughs> it, 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 you can put it that way but yeah so um i try to put it in my project as much as i can of myself just because that's it's it's kind of our artwork in mm -hmm. a way but um when I, I do what i can and then sometimes like you just knock heads with the client they want it their way so you just do what you make it right to code and then let it be the way they want it to be yeah and i guess going forward into the future where do you hope the future of your firm to become or what do you hope for it to become um it's an ever-changing uh thought process in my mind um well first and foremost um more or less right now still a solo uh <laughs> preneur or uh i do have a uh, great friends who um help me with CAD every now and then, but I'm in the process of hiring some, not a full-time employee, but um, through a consulting company to have an assistant through for drafting. So that will help me pick up more work. But down the line, I do wish to have, I want to stay small. I would never want to be a big firm, but uh, be able to hopefully in the long run, hire one, two, three people. And at some point I would love to have interns and like, um, 
educate them the way my uh, past mentors have educated me, like my very first full-time job. Um, it was two partners. One of them unfortunately passed away, but in the time I got to work for him, he was very, he was like a professor. He would sit down and go through the whole set of drawings with me. So that helped a lot. He taught me how to size uh, uh, beams and houses and things to him. I know how to do a house from the ground up without like questioning myself, but I can't do that with steel or concrete, but houses is a little easier. But um, so yeah, I, I wish to one day, one day be able to like have an intern and make add another la- layer of education to my company. But um, I also don't, I want to expand that education portion, like be able to provide more information. And maybe I step back from doing the design work myself and just focus on that end and have people who, who believe in what I believe in and they're the ones designing in the firm. It's that's why I didn't name it Catherine uh, or Serrano architects. Mm -hmm. I never wanted my name to be, the face of the company because I wanted to be its own entity, its own living, breathing, like, um, I, I guess it's mini ecosystem of like, it can be owned or designed by someone else. It doesn't have to be me. Yeah. And that um, educational aspect is definitely something I can see you for sure leading because you have so much knowledge to share from all your experiences yeah. and stuff. And I guess in general, using the knowledge that you have, do you have any general advice for any woman of color or anyone who would want to follow in your footsteps and create their own firm or any business? Um, Yes. Uh, First and foremost, um, believe in yourself. And don't get me wrong. I'm still working on this. Um, I, uh, I, I think, I guess, also advice when you start your own firm or when you go the entrepreneurial route your whole life will be turned upside down and you will learn a lot more about yourself than you have ever will um it's um I'm not saying directly but like it starts to it continues to reshape you who you are because it it, if you have trauma in something something will come up and surface and you'll have to work through it um but uh, always use your resources um, in that term. Like, go to, if you have to go to therapy, go to therapy. Like, I'm in therapy. I actually had therapy earlier before this. But um, uh, uh, have a support system. Um, and I know I took me, I did it on my own. And you can do it, like, if that feels comfortable. But uh, something I learned along, like, after I did it, is, like, I, if I could have reached out to a support system earlier on, it could have been easier, but um, taking the route I did is now, I learned so much that now I can be the one educating mm-hmm. about it. Um, so yeah, do always do your research, but always listen to your own intuition because everyone can tell you, you can speak to five people and you get three different viewpoints. Like uh, not everyone will um, align. And at the end of the day, you need to create something that you believe in and you want to support because you 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 can start your own firm in various ways like you can take clients from your old boss which in the end you burnt that bridge or you can just start in a different type of sector and slowly build and create uh, and want to and then go back to the design that you were doing before like um i was doing medical uh, healthcare before and now I don't do any healthcare I promote it as healthcare but I have yet to do healthcare projects mm-hmm. but um it took time so I did wanted to detach fully from my previous firm before saying oh I'm gonna I don't want to take your clients um I if I'm doing healthcare I'd rather do the small mom and pop offices rather than working for the larger firms uh companies we worked for like um we were the in-house architect for um some pretty big uh, uh medical places in new york city and so just didn't want to work with that a lot of nuances uh but i'm going on a tangent there but yes uh believe in yourself intuition support system um and uh keep work hard but also take care of yourself 
because you will burn out really quickly if you don't take care of yourself. And um, I'm still working on that. If I can't focus, I need a break and it's okay. Uh, or it's okay if you don't work on weekends. Like it's okay to tell them you're going to need two, three more days to get something done because you need to charge your own battery and mental health and spend time with family and friends. Yeah. Solid advice. And now, not to spin it back at you, but what advice would you give yourself as a college student? Would you give your college self? Yes. Oh, my college self. Uh, I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Like, you don't have to work super hard 24 7. But um, I would have said, um, in the theme of support system, I was so focused on getting work done. I did not get in too much with different groups or like I was part of AIAS but I went to one or two events here and there I wasn't really didn't use it as a resource which is looking back if I had gone to more events I would have like maybe learned a couple things ahead of time um and like so also with Macaulay I went to some events but not all and because sometimes I wanted to go but I'm like oh I need to get studio work done and at the end of the day I'm like I could have gone for an hour or two and then come back and done studio work. But yeah, I think it's just also mature maturity. I think I had, I had a lot of things going on in my head, some baggage I needed to grow out of um, mm -hmm. or go through that. Um, now that I'm more mature and, and uh, think about it, I'm like, Oh, you could have adjusted, but I also believe to not regret your past. It's, it's led you to who you are now. So sometimes you need to go through adversity to uh, learn a lesson or grow even further. Yeah. But yeah. Good advice. I mean, I'm not, I guess I am technically in the same shoes as you were when you were um, graduating and stuff. So I could definitely apply some of that to myself now. Re yeah. kind of repeating it back to myself. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the advice and for telling us about your journey. Thank um, you. Yeah, now if there's any questions from the audience yeah. or anything. I see a chat. Oh, oh, no, this was, if anyone has any questions, that would be great. Please use the chat button. But I think I just want to just say I did go through your website and the educational part of it is amazing. I don't think I've, not that I'm going on looking for architects, but <laughs> um, you do a great job of explaining um, what it is you do and also doing it in two different languages. Um, and that takes a lot of time and dedication. And like, I just have to really, congratulate you on that because that's, that's huge um trying to educate people on something that's very personal this is either their home or their business this is where you're going to spend a lot of your time so and you so you want to really learn and know that you know this person cares about my space and know mm -hmm. that you're going to do a great job and just you speaking to Labiba, like you can hear the care. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you um, for Thank joining you. us. And I just wanted to just hit on what you said about networking. I know it's mm -hmm. not a large group here today. I know the weather is beautiful and everything, but if you are an alum on this, please reach out to each other, connect. You all have, you all are, you all were honest students at Macaulay, but you've grown mm -hmm. and you're doing lots of amazing things. And this also can be a support system. You have a lot of people doing so many different very things. Like you were looking for accounting. I'm sure there are like tons of alumni who are doing accounting. Um, so yeah. please reach out to one another. Um, that's what this community is all about as well. And that's why we're having these um, series just to let you know what alumni are doing, um, the businesses that they are um, venturing into. 
So we are very happy and proud of you. So you to end. Thank you. You're graduating. So congratulations. Yeah, to you. Congrats. I know this is finals time. So thank you for taking a little bit of time um, out of your hectic, busy schedule to join us today. And for everyone who just joined us today, thank you for your time. Um, we really do appreciate it. And I know we just have a few minutes, but if anyone do have any questions um, for Labibo or for Catherine, please um, let them know or just reach out. I, I think there's a slide that if you do want to reach out to Catherine, um, we're going to- Yes, Labibo, do you mind sharing it? Yeah. But yeah, uh, thank you, Charmaine, uh, for having me. Uh, this was um, really great to have this conversation with Labiba. Um, and thank you, Labiba, for, for, for all the insightful questions. Um, uh, just uh, for the audience, she came up with all the questions herself. And I did know a few of them ahead of time, but I just thought they were very insightful and great. Um, and so yes, th this slide, um, that's my website, rootedarchitecturestudio.com. Um, Instagram's rooted underscore architecture. I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook. That's my phone um, and my email address as well. Feel free to uh, shoot me an email, follow me on Instagram. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I'm, always, I'm always posting new blog the first of the month. So uh, if you're interested in what I'm writing about, check it out every month, first of the month, something's up. And my website is also bilingual. And um, as I revamped it, it's also ADA accessible. So one, yeah. I, love, I love the paint one. So I thought oh, that was cool. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for that. Yeah. So if yeah. no one has any questions, please take... Catherine's information, please reach out to her. And what I would like to just say, thank you very much for joining us tonight and hope to see you at another um, series later on. Have a great, great. night, everyone. Too.